Hello everyone, and welcome to yet another one of my videos. And so this video is going to be pretty much part 2 and the later planned part 3 in one because you know that feeling when you've been planning something for a long time and you're just too lazy to get it done. Anyways, I'll be taking the bigger monitor I have apart for the second time. You'll get to see both of the circuits I made for it, and of course you'll get to see the results. So there's how the back of the monitor looks, and you can see I cut out a little more plastic there where the USB plugs in, and that's because the connector was put too close to the plastic case and so none of my cables could fit, and I could have fixed that by raising the connector a little higher above the PCB, but it is what it is now. And after taking the plastic cover off the back of the monitor, which was held by a few clips, you can see more metal and one of my modifications I made to the monitor. After undoing four screws from the sides of the monitor, I can finally pull off the metal shield that holds all the main electronics, and you can see my custom PCB in there, which is pretty messy and generates a lot of radio frequency interference, or RFI, that I'll show later in this video. I can disconnect the display cable, and there you can see my custom PCB and the LCD controller. And finally, I had to make this thing non-functional by cutting some wires. And that was kind of hard to do. <laughs> Especially knowing that this monitor worked for so long, but the uh, circuit was terrible anyways, so yeah. And after removing a few screws that are pretty much holding both boards in, I finally got both boards out, my custom board and the monitor controller board. And as you can see up close, uh, you pretty much have my custom board that I made so long ago. Like, um, I could do way better now, but this was what I did back then. <laughs> it's really messy, but it works. And so now to the schematics, and I'm going to explain this as fast as possible how it was meant to work so that you don't get bored, and of course I'm going to talk slower and slower, but whatever. So starting from the bottom of the schematic where things aren't too bad, and of course it's going to get worse, but anyways, as you can see there's a 555 timer that's supposed to generate a 4 kHz square wave, and the frequency can be adjusted with the potentiometer for whatever reason, I don't know why, but just a long time ago when I built this circuit or even designed the schematic, so I don't know. Uh, anyways, so moving on to the next part where the 4 kilohertz is used as the clock for the binary counter, the CD4029. The output of that then goes to a binary to decimal decoder, the CD4028. And once this part of the circuit counts to 4, the BCD chip sends a signal to the reset pin on the binary counter through a transistor. And now I don't see a need for that transistor, I would just directly connect the output of the chip to the other chip's out input. So if you're still watching this, you may be wondering why a backlight circuit wouldn't even need a counting circuit, and you know what? It doesn't. <laughs> Pretty much wasted parts here. Now the final part of the schematic that I'm gonna hate myself for sharing, but here it goes. So the outputs of the BCD chip go straight to n-channel MOSFETs that are used as NOT gates or inverters to invert the outputs of the BCD chip. The inverted signals then go to p-channel MOSFETs that pretty much re-invert the signal again in the PWM-like signal slash voltage because of the counter that comes out of the P-channel MOSFET's drain is also smoothed out by huge 1000 microfarad capacitors that pull a lot of current to get charged up, and even then the LED doesn't turn on because there's another MOSFET and... I give up.
schematics are in the description if you want to. And then the PWM that's generated by yet another 555 timer is then switching a lot of current through a MOSFET, and that current goes through a resistor that actually is nothing but an inductor in disguise, and that pretty much generates a higher voltage, and also the caps can't handle that. Okay, I'm done. Hey, thanks for watching and I'll Okay, now the second schematic, and it's also going to be in the description as always, and I'm going to explain it similarly like the first one, only this time it's going to be way better and there's less elements to it. I at least want to give you an idea of what's happening. So this time I'm driving the LEDs a whole lot better, not perfectly, and yes this circuit is still not the best before you comment on anything, but I didn't want to remake the LED strip in the monitor, so that's why. Anyways, each strip of LEDs in parallel are connected to some very low value resistors. I used 0.14 ohm ones because that's what I had at the time of recording this video, but I'll probably change them later because I think they're too low. Anyways, for those who don't know, those resistors are supposed to divide the current up evenly between the LEDs if they're connected in parallel, and really all of the LEDs that you see connected in parallel without resistors really should have them, but again, I don't want to change the LED strip there's just going to be a higher chance that one could fail. Okay, so connected to the anodes of the LEDs is a buck converter that's supposed to step down the voltage to just a little above what the LEDs are rated for. And now the part that controls the LEDs, and this won't take as long as it looks, so... This op amp with the one and only MOSFET this time and the very low value resistor form the main current limiting circuit for the LEDs, and at the same time it also allows the LEDs to be turned on and off, or let a PWM signal control the brightness of the LEDs. So basically, the op amp is doing everything in its power to make the voltage on its inverting input equal to the voltage that's on its non-inverting input by controlling whatever's connected to its output, which in this case is the MOSFET, 
So when the circuit gets powered on, the op amp is going to keep applying more voltage to the MOSFET until enough current can flow through it and the current sensing resistor, making that voltage on that resistor rise until it matches the voltage set by the potentiometer. Okay, and the final part, because I did mention PWM and on-off control, and that's this transistor here. It can pull the MOSFET skate to zero volts, or ground, or whatever you want to call it. Zero volts is probably more correct. Anyways, that's also why the op-amp is connected to the MOSFET through a resistor, so that way the bipolar transistor can't short the output of the op-amp to zero volts. And this idea comes with some downsides because then the resistor with the MOSFET form a RC filter that slows down the signals coming from the op amp, which is bad for a constant current circuit that needs to act fast, but according to my oscilloscope, it's fine. Anyways, to that bipolar transistor are connected two more transistors that are connected in a way to make a NAND gate, and one input of the NAND gate is connected to a PWM from the monitor, and the other to the on-off signal from it. So pretty much, only when both of the inputs are high, the output of the NAND gate is low, and then the transistor connected to the MOSFET doesn't turn on, and so it allows voltage from the op amp to turn it on, and the LEDs also turn on. And that's everything, if you didn't get lost. Well then, uh, now I have a few more things to say and that should be it for this video. And I want to answer one main question, and that is why even do this to a monitor? And what pros and cons are there to doing this? Uh, let's start with the cons, because there's a lot of them. So the first being that you have to have a 5 volt source that can provide enough current, and the bigger the monitor is, and the higher the resolution it has, the more current it will require. And mine already pulls about 1.5 amps for the bare LCD, which was measured when most of the pixels were black, and another 1 amp for the backlights. So 2.5 amps in total. And then you need a cable that can handle that much current, and those cables are usually short if they're USB, of course. Otherwise, the voltage drops too much and the monitor can start acting weird or not even turn on because it's being underpowered. You also might not get accurate colors anymore because of changing the backlights, if that matters to you. The monitor might also be dimmer, but it depends how much power you're willing to put into it. And of course, you're limited by whatever cable you're using to power it. And because I'm using USB, well, putting 5 amps through a USB cable kinda isn't uh, portable really anymore. <laughs> And, of course, you risk destroying the whole monitor, like breaking the very fragile LCD panel because it's pretty much a very thin piece of glass. And now the pros. Well, the monitor is more portable and you don't need any inverter, just a good sized power bank that can provide enough power, or of course a 5 volt charging brick for like your phone, for example. But anyways, because it can run from 5 volts, if you have a computer that can run from 5 volts like a Raspberry Pi, you could build a mini portable PC thingy that runs from just a power bank. But of course, a good laptop is definitely more powerful. And that's kinda it, so feel free to add more in the comments if you can come up with any. And now I don't have anything more to add to this.
I'm just happy to get this over with. So you pretty much reached the end of the video, but if you're still watching, well, I started a Discord server if you want to talk and share some knowledge or just chill, <laughs> and uh, the link is also in the description. Well then, thanks for watching, and definitely tell me what you think about the video in the comments below. I did try a whole lot of new things this time, and I'd love to know what I can improve. You know, this was a terrible idea, a big mistake to write a script, like, why, and this isn't even all of it, there's more.